Hello and welcome to today's webinar focused on helping app owners and app developers retain the customers that they already have. Uh, my name is Jay Hinman and I am the VP of Marketing at NewMob and I have the honor of being both the host of today's webinar and as well as a presenter later in our program. So we've brought together experts from three different companies within the mobile app ecosystem, uh, Apptelligent, Apptentive, and NewMob, and we're, we're going to share some of their or our best strategies for combating mobile app churn. Each of us comes with our own unique and interesting take on this problem, uh, along with real-world solutions for mobile app retention that you can implement right away. That's the plan. Um, and our other plan is to keep this to no more than 40 minutes. So each company is going to talk about 10 minutes before turning it over to questions from you. And you'll see that you can type your questions in the GoToWebinar questions area. Just uh, click on that and you'll be able to type your question. But please make sure to address whom your question is targeted to, whether it's to uh, Apptelligent, Apptentive, or NewMob, so that we can make sure that the most appropriate person is able to answer it. Or, of course, you can throw up something there that any of us can take. And you can also live tweet this webinar. And please, if you do that, please use the hashtag NoChurn. And we'll be monitoring these tweets during the webinar. So if you ask a question using this hashtag, we'll discuss it at the end of the webinar. This webinar is also being recorded, and it will be available to all attendees once it's completed. So we are gathered here today to figure out how to combat this problem, the one that says that only 25% of our customers are using our apps three months after they've been downloaded. This data has been pretty consistent across all countries and regions, and it's worse in some and better in others. We know that customers can be fickle and that they like to download lots of apps to try before they actually commit to them, and certain categories like games have you know, especially large problems with churn. So this webinar is designed to tackle how to turn that 25% into 30% or 50% or even 80% for your app. To that end, we have three speakers today who will each provide a perspective that we think can help. So we're starting with Rob Kwok from Apptelligent. He's the co-founder and CTO, and Rob will be talking about measuring app performance from the customer's perspective. We'll then move on to Emily Carrion, who is the Apptentive VP of Marketing. And Emily will talk about how to reduce churn through active listening and proactive engagement. And finally, I will talk about what keeps app customers engaged in the mobile-first countries. And remember that hashtag, no churn, there in the lower right corner in case you want to tweet something or ask a question. So without further ado, I'm going to change over now and have Rob from Apptelligent give his presentation. All right. Great. Thanks, Jay. So my name is Robert Kwok. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Apptelligent. And um, as Jay said, churn is a huge issue in mobile. And I'll be talking about um, basically some insights into exactly why it's such a problem. And then also give some best practices from, from some of our Fortune 500 customers like Groupon, eBay, PayPal, and explain you know, what are the five best practices that they employ to reduce churn in their applications. Um, and many of them take basically a, a user-centric approach, and I'll explain what that means later. Um, so uh, just to explain a little bit about what we do, Apptelligent is basically uh, an SDK you add to your app that basically connects uh, performance metrics to business metrics in your application. And basically, we can tell you how customer experience is performing in your mobile app and how to optimize uh, that experience to deliver a five-star experience. So um, if we talk about mobile, I mean, mobile has really revolutionized the world, right? Um, I think one of my favorite quotes is actually from the CEO of the, the Royal Bank of Scotland, who said, um, their busiest branch is no, no longer you know, a physical location. It's actually a train. It's actually commuters that are commuting to work from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. and using their app to do mobile banking. And that really kind of illustrates, well, what's changed and what's been great for consumers, but also kind of what's challenging in mobile. I mean, now no longer are you, you know, uh, servicing customers in a, in a different location in the world. You're having to service all these 150,000 customers all at the same time. Uh, they're all in different locations. They all are moving, you know, at 60 miles an hour on a train, and they're all, you know, switching in and out of uh, connectivity. 
and you have to make sure your app works for every single one of them. So, you know, a lot of, not surprisingly, a lot of customers experience uh, a lot of problems, you know, using mobile applications. I mean, how many of you have, you know, tried to, you know, purchase a plane ticket and uh, when you hit that purchase button, you get an error message telling you to try again later. Or maybe you're, you know, shopping for a new wardrobe and when you're, you know, when you hit uh, search, you just see the spinner that's just, you know, spinning and you're waiting for a list of search results to, to show up. Or maybe if you, you're using a shopping app and you've, you know, spent 20 minutes adding everything you want to buy and then when you hit that checkout button, the app crashes. Um, you know, these are all very common crashes uh, or common problems in applications that are extremely frustrating to users. And, you know, we can see their frustration in the App Store. Um, as Jay talked about, you know, with this complexity in terms of mobile, you also have that coupled with super high expectations. Everyone, for whatever reason, expects their apps to run perfectly. Um, and this is actual, an actual review from the App Store that shows a customer that's been so frustrated with the performance of the application that, that they've not only stopped using this application, but they've actually switched over to one of their competitors, kind of a, a worst case nightmare scenario. And you can see you know, how easy this is and uh, it could be years of effort basically gaining that customer. It could be gone uh, within a day of your app not working. So, and all the data you know, proves, proves that otherwise um, as well. So we have 30% you know, of consumers that indicate they'll actually leave a brand due to a bad customer experience. Um, there's high expectations. Over half of people think that using a mobile app should be easier than using a website. And so you have all these high expectations uh, and you're kind of, you know, it's very difficult to de deliver a great mobile app. So what can you do? Uh, so a lot of our customers have taken kind of this user-centric approach and one of the uh, things that they've adopted is what we, we call at Aptelligent the hierarchy of abandonment. And this is really kind of taking a, a look at your app from your user's perspective and thinking about you know, what makes them happy and what makes them sad about your application. So at the top of this is really you know, the worst case. This is, this is failure. This is a user trying to use your app and it doesn't work. Either features are broken, the app crashes, it's free or it freezes. Um, then you have frustration. You know, a user is using your app, they like it, but things are just slowly creeping in. It, it takes a long time to load. Um, you're, you're trying to commit a search and it, and it takes a lot of time. They're just waiting constantly in the application. Um, and there's also annoyance. You know, maybe the user is using your app, um, but at the end of the day, they notice by noon, you know, all the battery life is drained or they get a huge overage bill uh, from their carrier and they decide, hey, you know, this app isn't worth it anymore. They uninstall your app. So what can we do about this? Um, there, so we compiled kind of five best practices from some of our top customers about what they do in the application to make it, uh, to improve on this and reduce churn. The first thing that they do is look at crash. So everyone knows that crashes are bad, but a lot of our best customers have kind of created a methodology around how, how to go about fixing crashes in their application. Um, and a lot of them have adopted this methodology of taking the top 10 crashes every sprint and just have a, a regimented approach where they fix the top 10 every sprint. And through this methodology, they've actually reduced their crash rates to less than 0.25%. And we've seen they've had a high correlation with increasing their App Store reviews to you know, above five stars. And you know, a lot of companies don't do this, but uh, in fact, 75% of them uh, don't meet the standard. But the best ones um, have really done this, and it's, it's really improved their retention and, and reduced churn in their applications. But also, not all crashes are created equal. And so a lot, what a lot of customers have done is, is actually taken the top user flows in the application that are critical to their funnels, things like login, um, registering it for a new account, or making a purchase. And they've also identified and, and monitored how often crashes are affecting those specific flows in the application. A lot of the times if you're using an analytics tool in the app to monitor um, engagement or monitor uh, conversion rates, you'll see there might be a drop. And, but you might not know why. And a lot of the times these are actually caused by performance issues such as a crash or 
um, you know, a failure in the application. And so it's really important to kind of track these flows and make sure that they're performing well in the application. And a lot of them monitor an additional metric. They take that crash rate. They also apply it to these flows in the application as well and make sure those are below 0.25%. Um, and another metric that we found um, that's been really uh, kind of coming out uh, for a lot of the, the top tier apps is really looking at the app load time for, for applications. And we found that there's actually a high correlation between how long it takes for your app to start up and user engagement in the application, which makes sense. I mean, if you're using an application, you tap that app icon. If you're waiting for five seconds, 10 seconds for that app to start up, you're going to stop using that app. You probably will find a competitor's app to use and, um, and you know, stop using that application right away. And we found that you know, in, in surveys, 50% of consumers have actually consumed, uh, considered upload time to be a major source of frustration. And a quarter of them would actually leave a brand entirely uh, just because their app took a long time to start up. So this is another metric that uh, a lot of our major customers track and trend over time in their application and make sure that this is actually below two seconds. Uh, we found that that's kind of the, the average and that's, the, that's what you should shoot for being below two seconds in the application. And finally, uh, one of the other metrics to really track is um, how, how much your app uses in terms of your user's data plan and battery life. And we found that a lot of SDKs, a lot of ad providers um, can actually add a lot of bloat to your application um, and kind of increase the number of network calls your app is making, and increase the amount of activity that's uh, happening in your application, and that could actually kill your user's data plan or battery life. And as consumers you know, upgrade to these new devices, they install multiple applications, they're using their phones all the time, uh, users will get frustrated if you know, by the middle of the day they run out of battery life. And so this is one thing we highly recommend is looking at you know, the number of network calls that your app is making, um, especially as you release a new version of the application. Make sure that you're not killing your user's battery life or so I've talked a lot about issues uh, that you should look for, out for and monitor, but you can, also, you can actually take a very proactive approach to having one of these, um, these problems in your app as well. And one of the things we recommend is also um, messaging users after they have a bad experience. And, that's, and this is actually one of the reasons we partnered with um, uh, <coughs> Apptentive recently. Uh, one of the great use cases that we've heard from customers is if there's an issue with the application, maybe they had a crash on the, on when they start up the application, or maybe they make a purchase and the application uh, fails for whatever reason, going back to that customer and saying, hey, we're sorry you had an issue, uh, we're working on that, we're going to fix it with the latest version, that has done wonders um, to both customer satisfaction as well as uh, bringing back customers in the application. So look at you know, how these performance issues affect retention, what do users do after a crash? How does app load time affect retention? And then create segments in these analytics tools like Apptentive and look at, you know, send them a message and say, hey, we're sorry that you had a problem. And you'll find that a lot of these users will actually, you know, take your apology and come back and, and start using your application. So in summary, um, you know, there's a lot of developing a mobile app can be very challenging. Uh, you have to deal with a lot of issues where consumers have high expectations and there's a lot of complexity in mobile. But a lot of our top customers have found uh, a lot of success um, applying some best practices. So fixing the top 10 crashes each sprint, getting down to a 0.25% crash rate, prioritizing the crashes that occur in the most important flows in your application, like login, like purchase, lowering your upload time to less than two seconds, not killing your data's your customer's data plan or battery life, and then if you run into any of these issues, reaching out proactively, engaging these customers, and apologizing for these bad experiences. Um, so these are some best practices that some of our best customers applied, and hopefully you guys can apply some of them too. Uh, if you want to learn more, um, go visit us at apptelligent.com, or send me out a tweet at Rob Kwok. So thanks, and I'll pass it over to uh, Emily. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rob. Let me get this.
Come on. There we go. So my name is Emily Cadillon, and I'm really excited to share some tips about specifically that last point that Rob was talking about, about how to reduce churn through active listening and proactive engagement. So we're going to talk about mobile customer expectations, in-app engagement and listening strategies, and best practices for increasing retention. Uh, but first, a little bit about Aptenive. Uh, we've been designing and developing customer engagement software for over five years now. Um, as a mobile-first organization, we empower companies, marketers, and product managers to start conversations, listen, and respond to their customers. So this helps them drive downloads, improve customer experience, and boost retention and customer lifetime value. We have the privilege of working with uh, hundreds of companies around the world, such as Nordstrom, eBay, and T-Mobile. Customers expect companies' immediate responses and personal exper personalized experience, just like Rob was saying. And we ran a survey that showed that 96% of unhappy mobile customers, they never complain and they never communicate with companies. 91% of these unhappy customers will never come back and you won't know why they left. Which means that reactive communication is not enough. We can't wait for customers to tell us there's a problem or they'll churn or they just won't tell us. So as this graph shows, when done right, proactive engagement leads to happy customers and higher retention. Data from over 2,000 customer apps showed us that when companies interact with their customers in-app, their app customer retention is four times higher than those who don't proactively engage. <laughs> uh, that's great, but now what? Uh, next, I wanted to walk through a few ways you can proactively engage. Okay, so you saw something like this about Rob. So remember what Rob was telling us about how Apptelligent helps identify issues in your app? Um, so after you've identified some of these negative customer experiences, you can use a prompt like this as a heads up. So imagine the situation. Uh, say at 9.30 a.m. you find out that a specific segment of customers is experiencing an app crash. Well, with Apptelligent and Apptentive integration, you can set up a note to all the customers who may hit that crash point by 10 a.m. Which means that by giving customers a heads up before they even have a crash, you'll A, reduce your customer's irritation with the issue because you're able to warn them, and B, you could show your customers you are aware of the issue, you're working on a fix, and you care enough about their mobile experience to go out of your way to tell them about it. Proactive prompts are what we call notes will help you build trust and credibility in the eyes of your customers and that they'll save the relationship with your customers in an event of a crash. So here's some of the behind the scenes of how this works. Basically you set up, a tar you set up targeting and um, customer notes what the customer might be experiencing. And as a side note, if you weren't able to get ahead of the problem with a proactive message, there's still value in issuing an apology after the customer has experienced the issue. Uh, as we all know an apology goes a long way and you could also use a note to send a targeted apology, apology to customers who had a less than ideal experience. So say there was a crash, the next time they log in you could say, wow, we're so sorry about that, so glad you came back or, or something like that. So mobile surveys are another way to proactively engage with customers. And I want to I want to uh, emphasize that customers want to leave feedback. We did a study with SurveyMonkey that found that 98% of mobile consumers are likely to leave feedback when asked for it directly. So how should you think about mobile surveys? Well, this example on your right, it it's only two questions long. It's both qualitative and quantitative. It's clear, and most importantly, it's in the app. You don't have them leave their experience. This makes it easy and convenient for the customer. And we've seen that proactively asking customers for feedback in-app can help companies hear from even 50% of their customers, which is way more than the typical 1% that companies usually hear from. So another way to gather proactive feedback is by asking your customers if they love you. Since many happy customers may not go out of their way to provide positive feedback or any feedback, a ratings prompt allows you to hear from these silent but happy customers. 
So remember that 96% of unhappy customers that, that they never complain? Well, a ratings prompt gives them an outlet to tell you why they are unhappy, which gives you the ability to fix the situation and save the relationship. So here's a sample flow from the Nike app. Uh, first, they would ask, uh, do you love the Nike Plus app? If they say yes, the customer is then asked if they would mind rating the app in the App Store. This is kind of a filtering mechanism. If they say no, the customer is asked for feedback so that the company can improve the customer's experience. Um, on the left, you see this is like the open-ended feedback they could at collect, or they could use a survey uh, with some qualitative data to gain color on why the customer doesn't love the app. If you don't have a way for customers to share feedback from the app, they will take them public mediums. They'll, they'll take to the public mediums like the app stores or social media. This is why we strongly encourage companies to set up a listening tool in the app. Because one of the most frustrating things about the app stores is that there's no way to respond to customer feedback. By having feedback come directly to you, you're able to respond and let the customer be heard. The easiest way is to provide an in-app feedback button. So let me walk you through how Overstock.com collects customer-initiated feedback. So you can see here in the Overstock menu, customers can go to the Help section, and then they can tap Message Center, and then they can leave feedback. It's, it's really that simple. Overstock uses Message Center to capture open-ended qualitative feedback because uh, they, want, they want to hear the nuance and what the customer is saying, and they have a big team to handle these. Other customers have their feedback button lead to a survey or, or link to an FAQ. But again, the key is to keep them in the mobile experience and not send them away. So the quality and quantity of your interactions with customers will rise following the, these best practices. Right time, right place. Customers will respond more positively if you don't bother, if, you know, you don't bother them, they don't feel interrupted. So make sure to be mindful of when you're prompting your customers. And for right person, be sure to segment your customer base and avoid any unnecessary or over-communication that will come off as impersonal. Okay, these are kind of fun, but here are some real life examples of what not to do. Okay, so the one on the left, this is the calculator app. And this is literally in the middle of a while doing the calculation, this prompt came up. And then when you click it, instead of a dialog box, it, it pulls up these numbers. It's definitely the wrong thing to do. And funny, Rob also mentioned uh, an airline example, but we have this one here where um, the customer is trying to book a ticket to from Seattle, and in the middle of this experience, a very high, uh, this is a high revenue transaction, this prompt comes up to take a survey. This is the wrong time to prompt a survey. And, oh, by the way, this survey is 30 questions long, which I don't know about you, but I don't want to take a 30-question 30 30 survey in the middle of my transaction. And on the right, oh, man, this one, this one has a lot of good things, a lot of, good, <laughs> a lot of wrong things. So first of all, there's a, a whole bunch of emojis. There's multiple calls to action. They're saying maybe you could go to this email address, or they want you to click on all these buttons. So in mobile, you really want to keep it simple, and you want to have the messaging make sense for the medium. So here's some good examples of what to do. For this Nordstrom prompt on the left, they wait until the shopper has completed a certain number of, tra of actions. Um, they wait till they've browsed a long time or they've finished the, they've finished the purchase. And this mirrors the in-store experience. Because you know how when you're shopping at Nordstrom, the sales rep, they wait to approach you until you have an item in your hand before they ask if you need a dressing room? Well, the same etiquette, it works really great on mobile. So let the customer achieve their intended task and then engage and communicate with them. In this next example, All Recipes has a feedback button in an obvious place that the consumers would look, so they have it in their help section. And then once the consumer gets there, they have this ability to provide two-way communication. And this overstock example shows how to be respectful and appreciative of the customer. They say, we love your feedback. Thanks so much. Like, we value you as a loyal customer. And by, this is a great way, this is a great flow for thanking before you ask the customer to do something for you. 
So proactively engaging your mobile customers will not only make your app stickier, it will drive consumers to spend more money and become more loyal over time. By following the best practices of proactive engagement, our customers increase their MAU, retention, LTV, and customer loyalty. If you want to learn more, we have tons of guides for mobile product managers, marketers, and the C-suite on topics ranging from mobile brand reputation, metrics that matter, ratings, reviews, and then there's this one, um, the state of mobile app engagement, which will really give you some benchmarks for how you're doing. And Jay, now you get to bring us home and tell us all about performance. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Emily. That was great. I actually learned quite a bit myself in your presentation. So this is uh, Jay Hinman from Numop, and I'm going to talk about what keeps app customers engaged in the mobile-first countries, and of course we'll define what that means, and more importantly, what keeps them coming back to your app again and again. So first of all, where are the mobile-first countries? Let's define what those are. So really, they're the places in this world where the internet experience begins and ends on mobile devices and not on desktop computers. People there may be new to going online, but chances are that when they did go online, it was probably on a mobile device. And it's where the cellular networks are really the only networks that matter. And it's where mobile apps actually rule and define how users work, live, and play online. And so I've listed some examples of some countries where we would consider mobile first countries. These are the fastest growing regions for mobile, for mobile apps, etc. Places like China, Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of mobile first market frustrations though. Most apps these days are deployed everywhere via the Apple Store and Google Play, or in the case of China, which has restrictions on third party app stores through Chinese specific app stores like Baidu's or Tencent's. The biggest app frustrations faced by users in these markets are generally experience-based. You know, the networks there are still pretty slow, as anyone who's traveled to Brazil or Indonesia or even to China will tell you. And coverage is spotty, particularly outside of the big cities, and it's the same problem that we had in the U.S. and the U.K. and, and some other places just a few years ago, and in some places, of course, still have. Um, the connection to Western hosted content, like APIs within apps that pull down images or videos or advertisements and other items, they often have to travel a long and circuitous route, often over the TCP IP protocols that were designed for the desktop web uh, decades ago. And really, there's just a lack of back-end infrastructure that underpins so many apps right now, with app developers focusing so much on what their app looks like and its interactions, and much less on kind of the more boring part, which is how it actually performs. So let's take a case study of China. Look at one mobile first country in particular. It's a big one. 62% um, of the country's population currently has a smartphone, and they're using apps to work and play online, spending over two hours per day within the apps on their phones in China. And moreover, they're actually spending money within those apps. Uh, WeChat makes approximately $7 per user, which is just unheard of. That's $7 per user per month within their app, um, something that you don't really see anywhere else. And ad monetized apps are a big thing in China too. Um, advertisers there spend five times as much money to advertise in apps compared to what they spend to advertise on the mobile web. And yet app retention is really, really tough in China. If you think users in the US and Europe are fickle, eMarketer e recently put out a report that showed that Chinese apps don't even retain a majority of users after only one week. That means that somewhere between 50 to 80 percent of all apps that are downloaded aren't being used just a week later. It's really true in China that you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Um, another thing to know is that the path for content to travel within China is very cumbersome, circuitous, and it's a very difficult one. That's because of this great Chinese firewall, which is the Communist Party mandated barrier that keeps uh, Facebook and Twitter, most Google products, and many others from reaching Chinese consumers. It has the effect of making mobile app performance in China highly unpredictable. On normal mobile networks, uh, the ones that don't have a government mandated firewall, you'll find that 70 to 90 percent of all app latency, it already occurs in the so-called last mile, which is the handoff from the edge of the internet to the mobile network to your device. Obviously this is worse in China because everything has to go through this filter. And finally, third-party calls, which um, Aptelligent made reference to as well, network calls to other SDKs and APIs, they really have the effect of slowing things down even further, which I'll discuss in a couple of slides. 
So just some quick stats from uh, the Western world. I don't have detailed consumer survey stats from China or the other mobile first countries, but I can say with some assurance that they're likely to mirror these from Dimension Research last year, who surveyed US and European consumers and found that 48% of users say that they uninstall apps from their devices due to slow speeds. 79% say they'll only try an app one or two more times if it doesn't work the first time. So that's four out of five people who demand a great experience immediately and they won't wait around if they don't get it. And while it's not as related to churn as it is to acquisition, 84% of users say that they use app store ratings to decide which apps they'll download. So it's important to make sure that yours are rated highly. Speaking of that, have you noticed that when users are dissatisfied with their apps, they take to the app stores to vent and complain? Notwithstanding the, the, the many that uh, Apptenta mentioned that don't do anything, but when they do get really upset, this is where they go. And have you noticed that as well, you know, how disproportionately those concerns are centered around app performance, around the app like not working for them when they need it to? I mean, this is really the bane of any app developer or app owner's existence. And it's why getting a handle on your app's back end is so crucial for retention, both in Western markets and in the mobile first countries. The hidden force that really underlies so many app performance issues is third party calls. These are a really necessary and crucial part of any mobile app these days. And a typical mobile app has at least five calls to third parties and many have 40 or more. And these calls are anything from feeds from content sources that serve up images and videos and text to ad network SDKs, to analytics tools, to all sorts of important and necessary features that are pulled from many places. They often weigh down app performance, and this is even worse on the slow and congested 2G and 3G and the newer 4G networks that power where most of the surging uh, mobile first user base is. So since your app's fashion, you know, that is the look and feel and its front end capabilities, can't really live without these third party calls, how do you balance them with the back end capabilities of your app, which is otherwise known as its function? Not surprisingly, the good news is that fashion and function can be balanced. Uh, the impact of third party calls and slow networks can be greatly minimized. Um, we at Numa, we have a simple two line SDK that accelerates everything in an app, including those third party calls, and it focuses heavily on speeding up performance on that last mile, the mobile mile, where 70 to 90 percent of all app latency occurs. Our flagship product is called NewMob Accelerator, and it boosts app speed and in-app performance by 30 to 300 percent everywhere in the world, and it runs over a global acceleration network that's in over 60 cities on six different continents. And not only does it make a big difference in speeding up an app's load time and its in-app performance, we keep hearing from our customers that it gives them the confidence to bring in more features and more third-party feeds and more ad network SDKs, video, and things like that, because they know that they'll still maintain a high level of performance no matter how much they add. So we make sure that app owners have full control to manage their app's acceleration only in those countries where they're seeing issues if they wish. So for instance, if it's behaving perfectly well in the US, UK, Europe, whatever, they can accelerate only in the places where it's not, or they can flip on acceleration all over the world. And it's also important to note what a difference an accelerated app makes during peak congestion times which is when network resources are scarce because everyone's fighting for them. So think of train stations, yeah, Apptelligent referenced this, at airports, other forms of public transportation during rush hours. So NewMob Accelerator, by proxying this app traffic over our global acceleration network, really gives these apps a priority slot in a congested area. And it makes the users of NewMob powered apps a lot happier and a lot more willing to stick with those apps and not delete them off their smartphones. This final slide just il illustrates the types of performance gains that are usually seen uh, by NewMob customers on a regional basis. And this is something available to all of our customers. They can actually see what happens within their app. The orange bars are the milliseconds in transaction time with NewMob, and the blue and green are without. So with that, we will turn it back over to you for any questions. And I'm going to be the question moderator guy here, so let me just see what uh, is being asked real quick and then we'll just hand out the questions to whomever wants to take them. All right, so we've got three questions. Let's see, Jesse Wayne Brown asks, what type of apps tend to have the least amount of churn? Um, anyone want to take that one? I wonder if Apptelligent has any research on that. 
Sure. I think, um, well, what we see is there's, there's actually a high correlation between the crash rate of the application and both uh, five-star reviews in the App Store as well as retention. Um, I think, you know, it depends on the type of application, but apps that, you know, where the user experiences are, are great, uh, where, you know, basically, you know, you can monitor the things that you want to do in the application. I think um, if you can do them quickly and perform, you know, as well as the customer expects, I think those are the types of apps that tend to do the best. Terrific. And then Jesse also asked a question, any research on the platforms that have the least or the most churn? I'm assuming this is iOS versus Android. I, I personally haven't seen which is uh, which has more churn from, from apps. I don't know if either of you know. Yeah, we haven't seen any data around that either. That's something to, to look at. Maybe we'll, we'll find that and then we'll tweet out when we can find uh, an answer for it under the no churn hashtag. <laughs> uh, next we have a question from Dan Unger for Apptentive. Uh, what is the best way to get set up via Apptentive or other services to enable in-app messaging? Awesome. Um, well, it, you know what, it's really easy. Um, so like um, all three of us, we, we have an SDK that their development team would drop into the app. Um, we've heard it takes 20, 30 minutes to get that set up along with um, events in the app. Uh, the events are really important. They're the, the key mobile moments in the app because um, all of our proactive engagement is really targeted. We, we want to do a really rich job of targeting. Um, so you'll drop in events. Um, I compare this to, as a marketer, you know how we drop in events on our website for GA to measure. Um, so you drop in those, and then everything else is server-side. So you could log into our dashboard, create a note, create a survey, create a ratings prompt. Um, and the beauty of that is that uh, you can work independent of your... Once everything is set up, you can work... You don't have to have an app change in order to send a new survey, in order to send a ratings prompt. Um, so the power really lies in... For the product manager or the, the marketer is what we typically see of who is in the product um, all the time. And Emily, I think the next question is also for, for Apptentive. It's from Adita Allure, and it's in terms of proactive engagement, if we're using the same to boost app usage or in, and engagement, is there a recommended frequency for interacting with people using the app, like once a week or once every other week, etc.? Adita, that's a great question, and that's really uh, that's really important. I, I really it depends on your app. Uh, we work with you know a, what we found is that uh, companies like you know Redfin or Zillow, where people are looking at houses over and over and over and over, they're going to have a very high amount of um, of touches. The threshold is very high, so they're going to say maybe after. 50 times people take this action of looking at a home, um, then we'll want to prompt them again. Um, typically we see people for the ratings prompt, they'll wait at least 45 days in between asking them again, um, some even longer, some it's um, on the sixth time they've come to the app. It really, you know your customers better than um, anyone, so we would want to personalize it based on how your customers use your app. If people are in it all the time, they're in it daily, then you can prompt more frequently. If people come back once once a week, once every month, then it has to be a little bit more spread out. Um, but the key is really, you know, don't bother them. Ask them at a moment when it makes sense. Um, and know that they want to provide you feedback on making your app better. Um, yeah, you can do some really rich things with that do you love um, or not of the app. Uh, what we've seen some customers do, if so they'll segment all the folks that say, "Hey, I love, I love uh, Matita's app," um, then though that would be a great segment of customers to maybe test out a new feature with. Say, "Hey, would you mind being our beta beta testing this out? We know that you you love us, and we really ex at, you know want your feedback." So there's really cool things you can do around targeting once you've created some of these segments. 
Great, and we have a couple more questions here. So Sarah Perkins asks, how are you tracking which page or feature is being used the most? And I, I believe this could be either for Aptelligent or Aptentive. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, Ap with Aptelligent, we have a, a product where you can monitor, um, basically, once you instrument the SDK, it monitors uh, which pages people view and then how long people are spending. Uh, but if you use any sort of analytics tool, um, you can you can actually monitor that as well. So um, yeah, you have a, a, a bunch of different options. Uh, we do monitor that out of the box. Yeah, a lot of our customers use you know Mixpanel or, or lots of different tools that way. And then you can all, you can monitor based on those events you set up. You can monitor, and if you use Aptenev, you can monitor how many times that event was triggered in the dashboard. Um, so that's another way. Great. It looks like we've got one last question here from Regan Kapadia, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, but thank you. This is a question for all three. Um, can any of your SDKs connect us to users who have uninstalled our app? And I'll say for Numog, no, that, that's not one of the features of our SDK. No, I wish. That would be, be great. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, I think the only thing I've heard is um, there is like a hacky way to do it where um, you can basically send a push notification to your user base and then note which ones did not um, uh, did not receive that notification. And then if you happen to have their email address, then you can, you can kind of reach out to them, but it's a pretty difficult problem. And um, because we're going to try to wrap up at um, 11.15 Pacific time, 2.15 Eastern time, we'll take one more question. And it's from Dan Unger again, who's asking, which top-line analytics tools do you recommend? Flurry, Mixpanel, Firebase, et cetera. I think it, it depends a little bit on what you're looking for. Uh, this is Robert Aptelligent. If you're, a lot of companies, if, you, if you're looking if you're already using a solution like Adobe for your web analytics and you want to kind of marry that data with the web data, we've seen a lot of enterprises kind of go with Adobe. Uh, if you're looking for kind of deeper analytics data, um, Amplitude is actually one of them that we've heard a lot where they have a really robust solution. Um, they're a little bit cheaper also than the other uh, app uh, providers. And then there's also there's always uh, Google Analytics is a, a staple that's free, easy to use, and then Mixed Panel and Localytics are the other two that we've heard about. The three we hear about the most are Flurry, Tune, and Mixed Panel. Um, for depending on um, what what type of app you have and what you want to measure. Fantastic. Well, thank you to everybody for attending retain, uh, Retaining Mobile App Customers, Three Strategies to Fight Churn. I think we had more than three strategies to fight churn here. Hopefully it was helpful for everyone, and hopefully we can do this again sometime. Uh, this presentation will be sent out to all attendees and will also be available as a video in other spots as well. So look for notifications for that. And again, if you want to reach out to any of the companies here, their URLs are listed here, Aptenev, Aptelligent, and Numob. And thank you again. Thanks for hosting, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everyone.